Hi. <laughs> My name is Ryan. What's your name? <laughs> cool. Nice to meet you. <laughs> all right. Oh, oh, all that aside, um, guys, can we give it up to David and his team for an incredible day? Absolutely fantastic. And for the rest of us, I mean, if we can, if I can indulge myself in one more round of applause, forced applause, mind you, um, let's give it up for ourselves for being a city and a neighborhood and a family today. The community, awesome. This means a lot to me that we're all here. So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming and for believing in this. I know it's a, it a Saturday, it was a big sacrifice, but dang it, this is awesome. Um, so we need to talk. Yes. Uh. Yes. Okay. Before we talk about anything else, um, I want to introduce you to someone. This is a man named William Wilberforce. He was around in the late 1700s. And if there is nothing else that you learn today from this man and this story, it's this. Oil on canvas portraits are the ultimate selfie. Slide, please. Yeah. Yes. Outside of that, um, William Wilberforce, let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he belonged to a small group of about 17 people, officially known as the Clapham Sect, or as they were caricatured, the Saints. Uh, they lived in Clapham, which, as David will tell you, is uh, southwest of London, a little suburb. And here's what made them special. They ate dinner together two, three times a week. They hung out. They shared their lives. They went to church together. Their kids went to Sunday school together. And when they moved, they moved as a family. When William Wilberforce was 24 and his good friend William Pitt was 26, they got into the British House of Lords. And this little Clapham sect, this little family, 17 people, just normal people here in London, in industrial London, I mean pre-1800s, they got together and they said, you know what? We think slavery's wrong. It goes against our beliefs. It goes against how we see that we should love people. Let's do something about it. Um, one of them was famously to have said, it often gets attributed to William Pitt, to William Wilberforce, even at that young age. William, we're too young to know it's impossible, so we'll do it anyways. In 10 years, they had put the lid on the coffin of the slave trade throughout the entire British Empire. And they did it by eating lunch together by riding on horseback from town to town, by talking to people, by walking up in the middle of bars, in bars, in card houses, and singing Amazing Grace, totally stopping the conversation just to like say, hang on, guys, we really need to touch base. This is all great. Let's rewind. Let's connect. And so they ended, effectively, the slave trade. They were the first huge domino that fell. And if it was just that, that'd be great. And we could all get that. But here's the deal. That little group of people, the Clapham sect, they didn't just end the slave trade. They had 70 other social uh, causes that, that they championed. These were the first people to instigate animal cruelty laws, the first people to put in major prison reform laws, welfare laws, 70 different things that they championed. It wasn't a brand, it wasn't a company. Guys, it was a relationship. And it changed the world. A little community of people. We have more than 17 right here. Pretty neat, right? Um, and so right now this all seems a little bit spacey. I want to back it up to you with some science. Uh, side, please. All right, thank you. This is a a wonderful model of communication. In fact, if you've taken a comm class or business class, you've probably seen it. Um, it's called code theory, or to codify communication. And it works like this. A sender creates a message, and then you know this message can be delivered through a variety of mediums, and each person hears it in their own context, their own filter, so to speak, and then it gets to the audience. And so you know it's this very linear trans translation of this thought and this person to this person over here has to unpack it all. That's a transaction. And that was created by marketers who wanted to sell us a product. And we all wonder why we're sitting here and we don't know how to communicate. And when we see ads, we don't trust them. 
And if I could speak at least on the behalf of my generation, when we see things, we don't want to believe it unless the value or the gimmick is just strong enough to get me to buy in and think I'm beating the system. I'm getting the better of you just for once. And it shouldn't be that way. And we all know that it's causing all the problems in our world. We have a great disconnect that hasn't been solved. And things like Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and all these are great, but we need to get down to the root cause. It's that all this content is being created by people. We are wanting to achieve uh, a society right here in this room of great digital influencers. Influencers. William Wilberforce and his friends worked in the late 1700s. I think Twitter was still in beta. (laughs) And they changed the world. And they did it through powerful, meaningful, intentional community, through relationship. It's not that these exchanges don't happen. It's that we need to understand the sphere that they really happen in and what we should all be chasing after. Um, I want to give you a little bit of my story. Um, When I was a freshman at Oklahoma Christian, I heard about the water crisis. Uh, This is Marunja Rwanda. That's my, my friend Eden. And I heard... Now, as a freshman, again, 18 years old, world's biggest problem, about a billion people don't have access to clean water. It's responsible for 80% of all disease, 3.5 to 5 million deaths a year. That's 10 times the amount from armed violence around the globe combined. Women and children just walking to get water every day, dirty or clean, walking on average four to five hours a day, is uh, the equivalent of 447 million days of school missed every year. And it is greater just in the economic time lost than all the money we are shoving into Africa from any source, period. I heard about that when I was a freshman. I was poor. What am I going to do? And I didn't have any money, but I had a lot of friends. And so what I did was uh, I went back to my friends, and we talked about it. We shared the story. Um, We met on these little red couches on the second floor of the library there at OC. And about 30 or 40 of us got together and said, man, let's do something about this. And we did. And it was amazing. And that little group of friends, um, it's ironic. We actually, as we were all freshmen um, and sophomores, about 40 or 50 of us ate dinner every night in the calf. Every night. We created community. And so out of that, we started creating change. And so uh, we didn't have any money, but we had talent. So we put on art shows. We put on poetry slams. We put on concerts and bake sales. And I cannot confirm or deny that certain sophomore boys raided the Krispy Kreme dumpster and sold it to freshmen after curfew. We used whatever gifts we had. And it was amazing. Um, right here, this is a picture of, here, if you go back real quick, this is a picture, six of us even, even uh, went to Rwanda. Go get the story. No parents, no teachers, terrified. Um, all of the adults in our lives. It was a really great time. Uh, and past that, then we created a documentary, and it premiered in the Town Hall Theater in Times Square, New York, a bunch of college kids. Um, we got together, and so you had art, you had music, you had all these phenomenal things. Um, and going on from there, you had water walks. Uh, click. You had water walks across. This is a small one, by the way. You had kids walking miles across urban areas across the nation to tell the story of clean water and to experience it themselves so we could share it, so we could know. And what started as a little club with me and my brother and a few of our friends. In the next nine months, 13 other colleges started doing it. And we only really found out because we would get letters in the mail and it would be um, from a 19-year-old in South Carolina, so to speak. He's like, hey, I heard about you guys. I'm from friends in Nashville. Then went back to South Carolina over the summer. I was bored. So I went door to door in my neighborhood and asked for help. And uh, it's not much, but here's $13,000. Pretty cool. And that's been wishing well. And that's been our heart, is that we create community and we respond to this. Um, And it's fantastic because, again, we're talking about this whole idea of let's use community and relationship to change the world around us. And that's the way it always works. Creativity, what is it? We we give it a lot of lip service. Literally, I would say, um, as great authors Andy, Andy Crouch have suggested, creativity is our unique ability to dream up a world and make it happen. 
No one else does that. Nothing else does that. That's amazing. And then culture becomes how we are all actively shaping this world together. That's what's cool about social media is how we can do that. And so to give you an example, when we would advertise for events, it wouldn't be, oh, we made some awesome posters. We got some videos out there. It would be 20 kids talking to 20 of their friends in two hours at a coffee shop, 2020. We do this all across the nation. And those 20 kids in those two hours make 20 legitimate connections person to person. You want to talk about influencing the digital world? Influence the people who make it. That's pretty cool. And do it directly. That's a lot of clout. There you go. <laughs> Fun. So uh, to give you an example of just how this can work and how it's really neat, um, at Abilene Christian University, little little speck on the map in Texas, uh, just um, on October 14th, I believe, they had chapel there. They have chapel every day at this school. And the, um, the group there, the Wishing Well group there, they've been there for seven years, and they're still going. There's about 1,300 people or so that come to chapel, and they're like, Ryan, uh, we only have like 150 people following us on Twitter, and of that 150, it's mainly just us following each other. How do we talk to them? And so I thought, oh, well, I'll give you an incentive, and I'll see what you do. So I said, for every 100 followers you get, Wishing Well will match $100 towards your next well. Great, right? Yeah, wonderful thing to tell some, to some college kids. So they went to their chapel, and they gave a talk. Um, and one of them got up and gave this marvelous talk that I wish I could even come close to, um, talking about the realities of the water crisis. And as he spoke, every 20 seconds, two people would get up from the center of the arena and leave. At the end of the talk, 90 people had left. And there was a hole in the center of the arena. And it wasn't just a hole of random people. It was a hole of their friends of people they saw that they knew that they shared life with. And then the call to action from there was, of course, hey, some mysterious donor, the nonprofit we're working with, um, has agreed to give us $100 towards our next well for every 100 Twitter followers. So if I could click again, they all started tweeting, and that was great. We understand that. This is three hours later, 900 new followers. I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> and by the end of that night, 1,292 followers. And here's what's cool. That's not 1,292 random followers. That's 1,292 people in a school of only 3,000. With a tweet, they can communicate to all of their friends. It's Twitter fulfilled. People they share life with, they share relationship with. And that is the magic. And here's what's really cool cool, really amazing about all this, is that all this social inertia worldwide makes this. 90% of the Earth's surface has water within 100 feet. So all of our action over all these years, Wishing Well is eight years old now, all these students all across the nation doing crazy things, means that places like Maroons, Rwanda got water. And it was fantastic. And I've seen so many lives changed by this. And in fact, here, this is what a, a well would look like. That's that same well there in Maroonja. And that's awesome. And that happened because people here shared their lives more than with a button on Facebook. We shared it for real. And we were intimate and we invested in each other. And it's fantastic. And we shaped a new world in action of impoverished college kids from way back when ended up changing things here. But I really need to tell you all the full picture. And this is not it. This is amazing. But the dirty secret of the water nonprofit industry is that we used to kind of hide that, oh, 20 or 30% of projects break in the first 20 years. And in fact, it's not 20 or 30% in the first 20. Everything we know right now says it's more like 60% in the first five. And billions and billions of dollars are being wasted, and we're struggling to find new ways. But you guys have all probably heard recently, when we just dump stuff on people, when we just hand out clothing or hand out food, we're finding it doesn't work. And it's a fascinating thing. Um, and you know, we have economists who are postulating all these ideas of, oh, well, here's the structures that we need. But what I would propose is this. This wasn't a failure of a concept. This is a failure of relationship. Because here, we use relationship to change the world. But then when we implemented our project, as awesome as this is, if I don't, or if somebody doesn't connect with these people, nothing has been done. That will break, and it will be a metal straw on the ground. We are not in the business of projects. We're in the business of people. 
this in and of itself isn't anything. And I'm not saying this to say we shouldn't, because that's awesome. And incredible things and relationships can form through that, and it's phenomenal. What I'm, what I'm saying is this. All of our great struggles in life, if we were really honest and we examined them, I would, again, propose it's probably not because of a failure of a product or even a certain business plan. I'm guessing the pains in your life were a failure of relationship or when things went wrong. And that's what's killing us. And we've lost the ability to value it. And I love Twitter, and I love all that, but here's the deal. At the beginning of this talk, I introduced myself to all of you, and it got a little bit of scattered laughter, and one or two of you kind of ironically saying your name, but we all knew two things in that moment. One, it was weird. It was awkward. (laughs) It didn't fit there. Two, it didn't work. We need to restore relationships. If I want to love these people, I need to focus on restoring relationship. If I'm going to take on the world's greatest challenge, the water crisis, I need to restore relationship. I need to love people earnestly. I know this has been a little bit hard. So, Mr. Rogers, we're going to Disney movie this thing. It's going to get awesome, so hold on. Okay, um, Mr. Rogers, we all know, what was Mr. Rogers' favorite thing to ask people? Won't you be my... Awesome. Great. When I was in college, I had this really cool Bible professor who dressed, acted, and kind of looked like Mr. Rogers. Um, And his whole thing, funny enough, was the Bible and a word is relationship. So again, if you can't hang 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 on to that too much, the Bible and a word is relationship, the most read book of all time, relationship. So let's study it as intellectual people. In the beginning, you have this God who creates a people to share the world with. He doesn't put them in wilderness. He puts them in a garden and says, tend it with me. I've made you in my image. Do this with me. And then there's a split and there's a breakup and things fall. And the rest of the Bible is a story of this God who loves these people and this God who is loved trying to bring them back into relationship. So if I may be so bold, let's codify God. (laughs) You have a sender, a messenger, no, Here's the guy creating the word, so to speak. He's, again, for the purpose of this conversation, omnipotent, holy, all-powerful, all-loving. Great. He's really good at what he does. He knows SEO like nothing else. He's fantastic. And in this, he has messages, and his messages all throughout the Old Testament are phenomenal. There are, you know, uh, burning bushes and the stars in the sky and the oceans and miracles and wonders and Charlton Heston splitting the Red Sea. That's right, right? Just Charlton Heston? Okay, good. Um, And you have all these wonderful messages, and the contexts are as varied as, you know, slavery to the wilderness, to the promised land. Yet the audience never quite gets it. And if you read through it, even with these miraculous message mediums like miracles, it never takes them more than a few years, or at most a generation, to forget. And they always fall away. And that is what is so amazing about the next part of this book called the Bible, uh, which is relationship restored. Jesus Christ, this whole idea of God made man, Emmanuel. Relationship restored. When this wasn't getting through, that's what stepped in. I'm not trying to just stand up here and preach for the sake of preaching. This has a very, very applicable message for us here today. It's this. Let's look at your company. Let's look at your brand. Let's look at what you're trying to do. Let's assume for a moment that you are omnipotent, that you are all-powerful, that your strategies are perfect. Let's assume that you are tweeting the correct number of times a day, that you are following up on all of those Twitter conversations. Let's assume that you know not just your niche market, but all the other niche markets, and you know how to talk to each one of them just right. And what we know of the market says, well, you're going to get about 18 to, 8 to 15%, like hopefully, as you go on, but you better keep chasing those trends, and you better keep up with it, because it's a transaction, and you've got to move fast. So in a world where these transactions have robbed us of our ability to form relationship, here's another way I would recommend to you for operating your business, your lives, and how we're all sharing the world together. And it's this. So in Christ, so again, when this messenger became relationship, 
Here's how he operated. And again, from a sociological, anthropological standpoint, this. Let's click it one more time. Belonging, no matter who you were. Pharisee, tax collector, whore, drunkard, liar, traitor, normal guy. No matter who you were, you belonged. You were family. I'm going to come into your house tonight. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't, don't clean up. We're family. Love you. Then that belonging, and this is really fascinating, that belonging led to a change of heart. That change of heart led to a change of behavior. Those change of behaviors led to actions. And sooner you know, than, than the world history will give the account for, 12 un- uneducated men, uh, 11 of whom were violently put to death, well, 13 if you include the first one, um, changed the world. And we all look at Christianity and we can assume and you can have your religious thoughts, great. 12 uneducated no- nobodies changed the world from relationship, from belonging. Why I think wishing well worked isn't because we had great strategies in place. Guys, I think wishing well worked because I was a lonely freshman. (laughs) And water crisis was my trick to get everybody to be my friend. Uh, And it was a great trick, and it worked. And I had a catalyst for getting people to hang out and like me. It was wonderful. Um, And I'm saying that with all sincerity, but what grew out of that was, man, if you came to a wishing well meeting, and I have no idea how it started, but you know, you had 30 or 40 kids jammed into this room trying to figure out how do we solve the water crisis? Well, this guy does slam poetry, and we should do this event. We should put it on a street corner in the middle of like the Plaza Festival, and it'll be epic. And it was great, but somehow in that, just that let's all love each other and be a family, there grew crazy rules. Like nobody leaves until everyone has hugged everyone. Try that in a crowded conference room of 40 people at your next business meeting. It's great. And these things naturally evolved. And a program might fail, a project might fail, we might hit some rough times. But we all know, family sticks together. And that's what made it happen. That family, those relationships, that community is what unlocked an amazing power to shape worlds. Those worlds weren't just the digital ones, they were the real ones. It's fantastic. A couple weeks ago, um, I got to go visit my grandpa, who had just had his second stroke. And uh, him, him and my grandma are, are in ill health. And it was a wonderful time getting to talk with them and sing with them and pray with them. And we had a blast out on the, the, the Groves family farm in Ensign, Kansas, population them. <laughs> and we had a blast. And I was shocked because my grandpa, you know, he's having a few memory problems. They had tomatoes on the table, these little tiny tomatoes, garden tomatoes. And I asked him about them. He's like, oh, well, these tomatoes are great, but should have been here last year. And the year before that, you know, they were especially good. And the year before that, there was a drought. They weren't as great, but, you know, I was really glad. And I was blown away here in this farm of several thousand acres. And my grandpa, who's been farming for double my age, he could tell me about those individual tomato plants and those individual tomatoes for years. Fantastic. We all live in a world that says, get the big game. Go after it. Be cool. Be hip. Fake it till you make it. Why not? Run the transaction and run it well and get advantage of them. Make sure you get that margin and that profit share just right. I would humbly suggest that we're all from Oklahoma. I would want us in this social media world, in this world of community and relationships and people, and the people who are shaping the world together, which is us, and how are we, we are designing it, let's break the soil, let's plow things up, let's pull weeds, let's plant seed, let's find out where to put fertilizer, let's build relationships with the ground that we're on. Because I know it's something, being from the Midwest, as I'm sure you all are, if you really want to land big game, plant a few fields. They'll come to you. Thank you.